Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Guan Ren. I'm a research scientist at uh, IBM Research. Uh, we actually have a research lab in uh, South uh, San Jose called the Almaden Lab. And um, um, today I will briefly talk about uh, foundation model, um, or in other terms, uh, large language models, generative AI. Um, as a background or context for the uh, data management work that we are doing in IBM. And I will dive into some of the details um, for us to discuss in terms of challenges and opportunities as well. So in terms of uh, foundation models, um, the way you can look at it uh, from a historical point of view is um, really it started off right uh, in 1950s and 60s as expert systems, and then got into um, the era of um, machine learning. Um, that's when we start to have uh, quite a bit of data, and starting from the 2000s, um, having a lot of data because of um, social media and uh, internet of things. Um, but still very much uh, a lot of data in order to build models. Uh, you have to manually label those, and uh, that's quite expensive. Um, and then you need uh, quite a bit of compute if you go down the path of uh, doing a lot of uh, deep learning. So deep learning has uh, come along um, in the past 10 years also to uh, specifically look at uh, not just language, but also uh, image and so forth. Um, but what happened the last five years uh, by introducing transformer as the architecture for deep learning, uh, you start to move away from labeled data to um, uh, unlabeled data, uh, self-supervision, um, of course, uh, with the uh, uh, ability to have more and more compute nowadays. Um, uh, that leads to the uh, emergence of uh, foundation model. And the way we look at it from IBM point of view, when we um, approach a foundation model, is really three parts. The first is the architecture, as I mentioned. So it can be encode only, um, and it can be encode um, uh, decoder combination, right? Um, but what's most popular is really uh, the decoder only architecture uh, that's uh, powering uh, uh, GPT and other generative AI models. The second component, which I will dive uh, more into, is uh, really the data component. And then the third is the uh, uh, compute. Now, um, if you haven't noticed uh, uh, what happens uh, um, since uh, the release of uh, chat GPT, um, it's really a, uh, a new arms race in terms of uh, how bigger you can get to uh, when it comes to large language models. And uh, there are hundreds of billions, if not trillions, of parameters available for the uh, transformer architecture. Um, and you are able to put in a lot of um, context as input or prompt into these models now. Uh, in fact, uh, a uh, single um, novel can be now um, provided as a prompt into one of these models. And if you look at the data, actually there are a lot of um, uh, tokens being consumed to train the models. And the largest one is, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, GPT-4, uh, 13 trillion uh, tokens uh, that have been uh, prepared and uh, fed into uh, training uh, to prepare the, uh, uh, the model to have the uh, uh, language capabilities. Now, IBM takes a slightly different view. Of course, we think the size is very important. That's a, a, um, a um, fundamental uh, feature of uh, larger language models. Uh, but also, because we deal with enterprise clients, uh, we think that uh, maybe a suitable size model, but with better uh, governance and a better mitigation of risks that come with uh, these foundation models is also important. Um, we actually released our first series of uh, models uh, called Granite Models back in uh, September. And uh, one of the things that uh, we um, put out in the market is we actually are able to indemnify our models as if it's a piece of software, um, as we usually do right, to our commercial software. 
Um, and I'm, I'm going to dive into the reasons that uh, we are able to uh, have the confidence uh, in doing that. Now, in order to get to the so-called enterprise-grade uh, foundation models, the very first thing that we have done is to look at the training data set and try and include as um, much uh, industry and domain data as possible. Um, as you can see, we actually include quite a bit of uh, f financial data in our training, but also legal and other um, uh, typical uh, domain data that's uh, uh, potentially left out uh, from uh, other data sets. So that's something that uh, we look at uh, from both use case and uh, data set point of view. Now, unavoidably, in order to do the training, you have to uh, include uh, a lot of so-called internet data. And uh, right now, there are a number of uh, sources of those. But one of the most uh, famous source is uh, uh, called a common crawl. Um, and that's a snapshot of the internet every month, right? And uh, it w goes back to, uh, I think, 2012 also, 2008 also. So you have um, 90 or so snapshots around. Uh, to be used as a uh, uh, data source for training. Now, there are a lot of problems of um, uh, these data from the internet, as you would expect. And, um, and that's uh, in part, uh, in large part, uh, causing a lot of problems uh, for the model. Um, purely from data quality and um, risk point of view, uh, there are uh, quite a few issues. Um, there are obviously inappropriate uh, uh, sites and contents within, right? And there are spam sites, and there can be duplicates of uh, legitimate sites. So there are a lot of duplicates. Um, even in some of the um, legitimate sites, there are a lot of uh, low quality content, junk content, uh, that you don't really want to kind of get into the model in the first place. Um, and then uh, the Data itself uh, has a lot of offensive and toxic uh, content, um, and a lot of uh, personal information as well, uh, from uh, demographic and uh, uh, representation point of view. Uh, they are pretty biased, right? Um, uh, because of the uh, internet users and how they uh, see their world and represent the world as is. Um, and funny enough, uh, given the uh, emergency of um, foundation models, uh, there are a lot of uh, machine-generated data in the internet now. Uh, so you uh, start to form a, almost like an infinite loop of uh, uh, AI generating some uh, output, and then the also, those output uh, uh, gets into the model as well. And last but not least, uh, um, researchers have found a lot of benchmarking data sets in the crawled data. So essentially, you are train, training your model right on um, supposedly um, uh, objective uh, evaluation data sets, and of course you kind of uh, score quite high, right, in certain data sets as well. So that's the problem that we are facing. And in order to mitigate these uh, risks, um, uh, we have um, uh, come up with a number of approaches, and this is uh, something I want to share and then uh, hopefully uh, have some discussion with you all. Um, the first is, uh, uh, very quickly, um, IBM um, is known for its uh, enterprise brand, right? And we kind of take uh, risk and uh, exposure uh, very seriously. So we put together a couple of uh, teams to specifically look at uh, what data we are taking in, and can we look at them from technical business and legal point of view, uh, if and how we should take them in. Um, and then when we do acquire the data, um, there are multiple ways of uh, acquiring those, and uh, they're governed by laws and the regulations in the US, in Europe, and in um, other countries differently. So how do we uh, go about those um, acquisition uh, decisions? And that's important as well. Now, equally important, we have uh, come up with a pipeline. And this is, um, uh, in a way, typical to what you would do when you have data for machine learning or AI project. Uh, you want to pre-process those. 
But given the larger scale of the data and the variety and the quality issue that we are coming across, actually this is becoming critical to our mission uh, even before you train the model. Um, so as you can see on the uh, uh, flow chart, the corpus itself as they come in is in petabytes uh, uh, scale um, before the text is uh, extracted. Um, and there's a lot of uh, um, binary files and uh, other content that we don't deal with yet, right, for uh, language model. So we do the uh, text extraction as the first step. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of duplicates. Um, and this is where it becomes interesting. So some of the duplicates are exact du uh, duplicates. And some of the duplicates are actually uh, by association, by similarity. So we do uh, large scale uh, deduplication. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, so if you look at uh, the uh, web data that we deal with, uh, those are probably uh, trillion um, uh, in size for each of the snapshot. And if we want to do deduplication, we have to do, across, um, do it across 30 or 40 snapshots. Um, so that's a very large scale data operations that we are running. And, and then in the middle, as you can see, these are the annotators. Um, we do um, annotation on the language itself, uh, whether it's English, French, Spanish, or otherwise. Um, we do the uh, uh, document quality annotation, uh, because some of the documents um, um, are fairly short or too long for us to uh, take in, right, for training. And we actually use um, a uh, uh, classifier that's called a CAN LM uh, to compare the documents with um, Wikipedia uh, articles and calculate the uh, perplexity score uh, to understand whether the quality is good or not. Um, a lot of uh, URLs um, are um, copyrighted or uh, having toxic uh, content, so we do uh, URL blocking as well. And then the HAP analysis, which stands for hate, uh, abuse, and uh, profanity. Uh, so that's the main chunk of the analysis that we do for each of the document and uh, remove or um, uh, delete the whole document if necessary, the toxic uh, content. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, there are uh, personal sensitive information involved in the documents, so we annotate and uh, mask those as well. Um, and then last but not least, uh, um, uh, the, the bias that's uh, in the document that we actually analyze those and, and, um, and doing some filtering accordingly as well. And towards the end, it's the uh, um, overall filtering. And here, the interesting thing that we have learned is um, um, in an ideal situation, you want to do all the annotations and you filter at the end. But because so much compute is uh, involved, uh, thousands of um, uh, uh, CPU cores uh, are involved. And in some cases, actually, we use a GPU uh, for the uh, uh, pre-processing. Um, you actually want to optimize uh, se sequence-wise uh, before you do the final filtering. So there's some uh, interesting back and forth uh, discussion and uh, optimization that we're doing internally. And then you feed the whole uh, data set into a tokenizer for tokenization and that gets into the model. So that's pretty uh, interesting. Now, on top of this, in addition to making sure that uh, the data quality is um, good enough and uh, risks are mitigated accordingly. Um, there's a strong requirement that we haven't really come across before, uh, which is uh, data provenance. Um, in many cases, uh, uh, people talk about uh, data lineage. Uh, that's another term. The primary use case is uh, given the uh, public uh, and government attention on foundation models, um, we and others uh, who are producing these models need to actually generate uh, data and model cards, um, and sometimes they are called uh, factor sheets. Um, and it is to provide the full tra uh, transparency and also traceability from uh, data to model. Uh, that's the forward uh, lineage. 
um, up until uh, some of the downstream applications, and then being able to trace back as well, right? Um, and it's not just about the data lineage at the individual document level. Um, that's something that we already track, but also the job and the run that has been uh, performed on the, uh, on the data itself. So that becomes more and more interesting and uh, important as well to disclose all the lineage. Because if you think about it, any of the uh, pre-processing jobs, if they have um, themselves uh, code change, and if we don't know about those code change, then uh, it will have some discrepancy in terms of the results that we produce. Now, there are other use cases. I think uh, this morning there was a talk on uh, open lineage uh, that mentioned. Uh, so you could identify actually popular data sets or even documents level um, and have some return on investment discussion. You can also start to have some debugging. So if you find any issues downstream, with regard to the model output, uh, you want to be able to pinpoint um, upstream to the tokens, but also to the raw uh, data as well. Um, and then last but not least, the impact analysis. Say we procure certain data set from private source, proprietary source, and that license has expired and we need to pull out that particular data set, then what's the impact on downstream models and applications? So that becomes interesting uh, exercise as well. Now, on the data management itself, um, we actually went into a traditional route, uh, which is more or less a data lake uh, approach uh, using a cloud object uh, storage. And simply because uh, um, it's uh, uh, relatively inexpensive to have all these data in one place, um, saved in a packet file format, and it, it can be accessed from anywhere uh, with open protocol. And then it, um, in the case of uh, we uh, need to uh, transfer the data from one place to another, as long as they are in the cloud, uh, the cost is minimum. But we run into a lot of uh, issues. Um, the very first one is uh, whenever you want to make any modification on the packet files in the cost bucket, uh, you have to save uh, additional copy of that. And uh, because we are dealing with um, um, uh, multi uh, terabytes of data, um, and that, that becomes a, a big issue, even though the, uh, the storage itself is uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, Another thing is uh, the version control. Uh, that's uh, lacking. Even though you can manually coordinate among team members to um, control uh, the access and also the version, but it becomes uh, really uh, challenging at, at the uh, uh, file level. Um, and uh, we have cases where um, some accidental writes uh, into um, the uh, source uh, uh, bucket rather than a targeted bucket. Um, so a lot of accidents um, uh, for innocent reasons, right, uh, take place. Uh, that's not ideal. Um, and then it's a, a relatively hard to track on the uh, lineage and uh, insights um, because the data itself is stored in uh, packet files and you can only track down to the, uh, uh, the file name and there's no way to get to another level at the document. Uh, level. And then if we want to understand what the data uh, is and uh, really explore the data itself, um, it's a little bit difficult to do as well. So as it just happened, uh, last year also IBM is uh, um, in parallel getting into the uh, data lake house um, um, space. Um, and actually today there are uh, quite a few talks on uh, data lake house. Um, and the whole idea is uh, uh, to have the uh, data warehouse uh, uh, performance, but with the uh, data lake uh, uh, cost uh, performance um, level, and then being able to have a open architecture uh, so that our clients is able to leverage the, uh, uh, the best or uh, the better of uh, uh, both parts, right? The data warehouse and the data lake. Um, so we have taken that approach and 
um, when we look at the issues from the cost approach, the um, uh, issues that I mentioned earlier, uh, we decided uh, uh, to also take on the uh, lake house approach. Um, the core component here is uh, on top of the uh, cost buckets and the Parkel uh, file format. Uh, we introduce um, uh, Iceberg, which is an open table format. Uh, now, of course, we have to add our own catalog and uh, lineage function. But on top, on top of it, uh, we are able to support uh, 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 the uh, kind of uh, execution engine of your choice, uh, usually what data scientists and data engineers uh, prefer to use, such as um, uh, Jupyter Notebook, uh, Spark, um, Ray is like upcoming. It's something that um, uh, Red Hat, um, uh, as part of IBM, is uh, endorsing. Um, so we need to support that as well, and Flink, and so forth. And on the other hand, um, uh, the Lakehouse uh, can uh, provide insights right, through um, query engines such as Presto or Trino, and then expose those insights and visualization in Superset and any custom uh, user interface. From get-go, the Lakehouse um, uh, architecture actually allow us uh, to avoid multiple copies of the data. And because it's a, a table format, uh, you are able to sort, uh, filter, and sample uh, as you like. So it has a friendly um, connection with uh, the SQL interface, uh, SQL queries that uh, most of our data scientists and engineers are familiar with. And what's cool about also um, the iceberg um, uh, uh, component is um, uh, it generates uh, automatic uh, snapshots of the data. Um, and we are able to actually provide tagging uh, to um, do the version control on the data itself. And if we ever make a mistake, we are able to do uh, time travel. Um, the tagging is very effective for us to uh, manage the version end-to-end -end that I mentioned uh, earlier uh, in terms of uh, the lineage. And then the time travel really uh, give a little bit more tolerance on uh, some of the uh, kind of unavoidable mistakes that we may make right, in uh, managing the pipeline. Um, now, as we do this, this is still very much a working progress. What we found uh, um, also is a set of uh, challenges and uh, opportunities that we continue to um, work on. The first is uh, uh, what I briefly mentioned. Ray as a framework is a really a, a great framework uh, that's scalable to run uh, jobs in a distributed fashion. Um, but it's a uh, uh, read and write support is fairly lacking with uh, Iceberg. So we're trying to actually contribute to the uh, Iceberg um, uh, open source community. Uh, with, with the function that we have built ourselves. Um, and access control is uh, not yet out of box with the Lakehouse architecture. So we actually have to come up with our own. Um, and the lineage itself is uh, so important for uh, the foundation model pipeline. Um, we actually invest quite a bit of time uh, trying to uh, come up with our own lineage. And as I said, it's not just uh, typical data lineage that we have seen in the market, um, but also being able to capture the uh, execution uh, environment, parameters, and so forth. That's a really tricky. Um, that's something that we are uh, uh, addressing as well. And then uh, the moment that we set up this um, uh, specifically for foundation model data preprocessing, um, there are other jobs, if you like, coming in as well. And they come in in different shapes and forms. And uh, some of the jobs are uh, pretty big, and they deal with big data sets. And uh, some of them actually deal with a smaller data sets, such as evaluation, uh, fine tuning, and so forth. Um, so the big question that we have now is uh, we don't provide relational database out of our lake house, but people are expecting, especially for smaller data set, uh, the kind of uh, performance that's uh, available for uh, relational um, uh, queries and, uh, and management. So that's something we are dealing with as well. Um, so this is uh, at least uh, to uh, us internally, a rare opportunity to have everything coming together, 
both the data and the AI as well as the um, governance and, um, and really think through how the data should be managed uh, for a purpose, right? So that's something we're working on. Now, um, up until now, I touch on the data component for the uh, enterprise grade uh, implications. Obviously, there are other things that uh, uh, we are doing to uh, mitigate less risk. Uh, from a model point of view, for example, you can do uh, quite a bit of uh, what we call uh, contrastive uh, fine tuning uh, to have negative examples sitting along with uh, positive examples uh, to train the model um, not to uh, generate uh, toxic uh, content. And, and there's a technique also called the uh, RAG, uh, retrieval augmented um, generation that uh, keep the model uh, truthful to the um, uh, data that we provide to, the, uh, to it uh, so that uh, it doesn't uh, hallucinate on its own, right? Giving uh, uh, answers uh, to whatever question is uh, posed to them. And then use case is something uh, very important, both from actual impact, but also evaluation point of view. Um, but last but not, uh, and the last but not least is the red teaming. Um, and that's uh, really in anticipation of um, uh, some of the uh, offensive content or PII content coming out of the model uh, inevitably. And then how do we address that at the uh, model output uh, level? Um, and what's beneath it is really a layer of a platform that we start to see. And probably for the first time, at least within IBM, uh, we see this as an opportunity to bring data, AI, and uh, governance together. And uh, we're introducing this to our clients as well as a way of uh, managing their data and uh, uh, AI and machine learning. Um, and then, of course, the people behind it is important. So the operations and the program management is also key. Um, so with that, hopefully I give you a um, brief picture of uh, what we are doing in IBM, uh, IBM research for foundation model training and uh, deployment, and why we care about uh, enterprise grade um, um, value proposition, and then some of the things that uh, we're doing behind the scene for data management. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions, and I can stay a little bit uh, uh, if we need some discussion. Yeah, we have about two minutes if anybody has questions. That looks like a no. All right. Can you talk at all about your data set sizes that uh, you've, we've got down there? I'm, I'm at IBM too, so I'm curious, just curious. Yeah, I, well, the data sets, um, I think what I mentioned earlier, right, the common crawl uh, snapshot, that's uh, about uh, a terabyte uh, data, but that's uh, already after the uh, tax extraction. Before that, uh, it was uh, much bigger, yeah. Um, and we're talking about uh, 30 to 40 snapshots, and for some of the um, uh, data annotation, it has to cut across all these uh, documents. So that's where the uh, scalability and uh, uh, difficulty comes in, right? Yeah. Last call. All right, let's thank Quanji. Thank you. <laughs>